Welcome back to the webinar. Welcome to anyone who's just joining us for the first time. Uh, we've got a great lineup today, um, but before we do that, I'm just going to put up here on the screen another reminder that Bond's going to be offering its full day labor uh, employment and HR conference uh, across the state starting pretty soon. Um, you know, May 16th is, is not that far away. That's our first date in Albany. So just go to bsk.com um, where there'll be a link for registration. Hope to see you there. I know I'll be at the Syracuse uh, event personally for any of you who are there. Um, I may be um, at others, not sure yet. But anyway, hope, hope you can come if that's your area of interest. Um, next slide would be our lineup for today, which I think is uh, an interesting one. It's also New York State Upstate Thruway Edition because we have someone representing all of our upstate offices today. Didn't plan that, but. Um, so we will start with Liza Magley, who's going to talk um, about uh, some litigation involving local governments. Um, that is just of general interest, I think, for anyone who pays uh, taxes, I think, um, which is everyone usually. And um, after that, we're going to go to Rebecca LaPointe out in Albany uh, about a pretty significant new OSHA rule that everyone should be aware of. Then back to Rochester for a, um, a topic that came out of your requests. I always look at topic ideas that attendees ask for, and this is one that's been repeatedly asked for, which is some updates, what's going on uh, in the world uh, in, the, in the courts in terms of transgender discrimination. Uh, finally, John is following up. I've talked before about this 50th anniversary of ERISA this year, that we would be having some more ERISA topics. And here we are today again uh, with another ERISA, um, sort of a, a beginner course in ERISA, we, we would say. So, okay, moving on to, let's go to, before we do that, I was gonna do a budget update and my update is I don't have one. Um, I thought by now, uh, where are we? April 9th. I thought for sure we would have a budget to talk about. We'd have a chance to talk about all those items that I covered many weeks ago um, that were being proposed in the labor space and that other presenters uh, talked about in other spaces. There's still no deal. It seems like housing is the is the hang up, um, but we're watching that. Um, so we'll just go straight now to Liza um, here, a member in our Syracuse office who's going to tell us um, about some recent litigation affecting local governments and property owners. Thanks, Liza. Thanks, Kristen. And good afternoon, everyone. I get the riveting topic of tax foreclosures. I know you're all waiting with bated breath. But like Kristen said, it's of general interest for anyone who pays taxes and probably even more for people who don't. Uh, Kristen briefly mentioned the budget and that there isn't an update. Uh, something that's in the budget uh, this year proposed by the governor is part and parcel of the litigation that we're about to talk about. So I want to start with that. Part N of the governor's proposed budget states that it, it seeks to amend the real property tax law in relation to requiring excess proceeds from a tax foreclosure sale to be returned to the former owner. This proposed amendment would provide, among other things, a mechanism for former owners of properties subject to tax foreclosure proceedings to obtain the difference between the amount of the taxes that they owed and the amount that the county or the taxing jurisdiction was able to sell their property for. All of this arises out of a Supreme Court case that was divide, decided in 2023 called Tyler v. Hennepin County. And even though it involves a county in the state of Minnesota, it's just as applicable to many of our taxing jurisdictions in New York State and in other states throughout the country, because a lot of them have pretty similar tax foreclosure proceedings, which are different from mortgage foreclosure proceedings that folks may be a little bit more accustomed to. So to wrap our arms around why there's so much litigation and legislation about this right now, I'm going to give you a brief primer on the Supreme Court's Tyler v. Hennepin case. This all started in 2020 when a woman named Geraldine Tyler brought a lawsuit against Hennepin County, Minnesota. She alleged that by selling her condo to collect her unpaid taxes, then retaining the value of her property in excess of her tax debt, the county violated her constitutional rights, including her rights under the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which, as a little refresher, provides that private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation, otherwise known as the takings clause. There was no dispute that the county followed the applicable law in the state of Minnesota and what it did. The dispute was over whether the county should have been able to keep the extra or the difference between the amount of Ms. Tyler's tax debt 
and the amount for which her condo was sold. The federal district court in Minnesota, and then the eighth circuit, which is the appellate court where things from the district of Minnesota go, found that Ms. Tyler did not have a claim. The eighth circuit stated that where state law recognizes no property interest in surplus proceeds from a tax foreclosure sale conducted after adequate notice to the owner, there is no unconstitutional taking. And that's pretty much in line with what our New York State Real Property Tax Law Article 11 says. In 2023, though, the U.S. Supreme Court reversed in a unanimous decision. According to the court, it was called upon to address this question. Was the remaining value in Ms. Tyler's condo over and above her tax debt property under the takings clause protected by uncompensated appropriation by the state? The Supreme Court summarized its answer to this question as follows. The takings clause was designed to bar the government from forcing some people alone to bear public burdens, which, in all fairness and justice, should be borne by the public as a whole. A taxpayer who loses her $40,000 house to the state to fulfill a $15,000 tax debt has made a far greater contribution to the public fisc than she owed. The taxpayer must render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but no more. Therefore, according to the court, Ms. Tyler had a Fifth Amendment takings claim. This decision has had a rippling effect across our country as plaintiffs in states with similar statutory schemes have started to bring cases against their taxing jurisdictions, counties, cities, municipalities, arguing that the state, the county, the municipality, whatever the taxing jurisdiction is, has retained the surplus proceeds from sales of their property and therefore have committed unconstitutional takings. As an aside, another basis for these claims is the Eighth Amendment Excessive Fines Clause, which the Supreme Court did not directly address in its opinion, but many courts have also considered when it's come to these cases. Now, as we know, the state is currently trying to update our legislation to align with what the courts found in Tyler v. Hennepin, but the legislation, the budget, we know the drill, it hasn't passed yet. And whether, where there's a gap, there's litigation. So we have dozens of cases here in, in our state alone against taxing jurisdictions. Taxing jurisdictions have dealt with this litigation in a couple different ways. They either have filed motions to dismiss or they filed answers. In both cases, the defenses are pretty similar, but because the area of law is developing, it's been hard to tell which court will go which way. And we're even starting to have some conflict among courts in our area. For instance, one of the most common arguments in favor of dismissal has been that Tyler v. Hennepin cannot apply retroactively to parcels sold before the court issued its decision. In those cases, the taxing jurisdictions are arguing, hey, if we sold this property before the Supreme Court's decision, we did it in accordance with our state's laws, and we shouldn't be subject to the burden that all these cases really could begin to implicate. For a while, we only had some guidance from the state of New Jersey, which suggested that the case could have pipeline retroactivity, which means that it could only apply to cases that were sued and during the time Tyler was pending. However, just last month on March 12th, 2024, the US District Court for the Northern District of New York, which covers our upstate counties from Albany to a little west of Syracuse, proposed a different answer. In Polizzi v. County of Schoharie, the county alleged that the plaintiff's claims against it necessarily failed because Tyler could not apply retroactively. The court did not entertain that argument for very long. It stated upon review, the argument must be rejected and found that Tyler should be given full retroactive effect. As a result, the plaintiffs in that case have been permitted to proceed with both their Fifth Amendment takings claim and their excessive fine claims against the counties. Now, the court dismissed some of their other claims, but it also permitted the plaintiffs to proceed on a common law claim, which is unjust enrichment. And the fact that these plaintiffs are now permitted to proceed with these claims means that that case in particular and other cases across the circuit will be paying attention to see whether the governor makes a decision and we can use that to help 
figure out the way these cases should go or whether the courts will be setting the standards for everyone to follow moving forward. And as the counties begin to engage in discovery and disclosure or the municipalities for that matter, it will start to get, it could start to get costly. So the questions then become, when is a decision going to be made by the state that will help people make those decisions? There's also a lot of other defenses that are still up for grabs. For instance, if a, more, a person held a mortgage on the house and then there was a tax foreclosure, should the mortgaging institution also be able to make a claim against these surplus funds? Then what is the amount of a surplus? You know, it's not just the amount of taxes the county was owed, but also what the entity has to do to go after the money that it's owed under tax law. We're keeping updated with this litigation as it progresses, and it certainly will continue to be an active area in our state and in legislation across the country. So stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you um, so much, Liza. I mean, I um, a lot of my practice is with local government, so I've been watching this, and I I think I don't think you can really overstate the significance. I mean, there are, you know, a lot of properties that have been taken over time for taxes and sold for more than the taxes owed, and so it's just a question of you know, you know, how are local governments going to deal with this, and you know, to be to be I guess to be continued. So thanks for updating us on that. Appreciate it. The other thing is like for all any law nerds out there, Tyler's a good case to read. It's kind of fun in a way. It starts out its discussion in 19, in 12 year 1215 in the Magna Carta. It's it's really a sort of interesting historical read if you're sort of nerdy that way, like I just admitted that I am. So anyway, <laughs> next up on our list is if we flip the slide here to remind me of our order. All right. The OSHA rule. How quickly I forget. So new rule just published. Uh, Rebecca wrote an article about this. You can check out on our website. Um, but she's going to walk us through today what this new rule is and the significance to um, to our, our clients and our friends here. So um, Rebecca, go right ahead. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. So as Kristen said, my name is Rebecca LaPointe. I'm an associate in Bonds Albany office for the Labor and Employment Group. Um, and I'm be, I'll be walking through the new OSHA walk around rule today. Next slide, please. So generally, um, OSHA allows employers to have an employer representative with the um, compliance, safety and health officer during a physical inspection. Um, the walk around rule permits employees to select a representative to join the officer as well. So under the prior rule, um, under the prior rule, it was it was sort of assumed in how the statute was written that the employee representative would be an employee of the company. Um, and this require or and for any sort of um, third party representative to represent employees, it was required to show good cause. Um, and this meant that they needed to show a non-employee third party was necessary to conduct an, effect, an effective inspection. So this has been interpreted to mean that the non-employee representative needed safety or health expertise to assist the officer in the inspection. Um, so for an example, it was expected that the non-employee representative would be an industrial hygienist or a safety engineer. Uh, next slide, please. So this new final rule from OSHA was issued on April 1st, 2024, and it makes it easier for employees to select a non-employee representative. So under the amended rule, non-employee representatives authorized by employees are not limited to those with formal credentials, such as industrial hygienists or safety engineers. Um, and also a third party representative authorized by employees simply has to be reasonably necessary to the conduct of an effective and thorough physical inspection of the workplace by virtue of their knowledge, skills, or experience as determined by the OSHA officer. Next slide. So um, this means that the the officer must determine that there is good cause to allow this non-employee third party to join. Um, however, with the new regulation, OSHA provided no procedure by which the officer will make a determination of good cause outside of 
uh, referencing the factors that are already listed in the rules. So relevant knowledge, skills or experience with hazards or condition in the workplace, or language and communication skills. Next slide. So this provides the officer with a significant amount of discretion. So employers can inform the officer that they don't believe it's appropriate for a third party representative to join the inspection, but ultimately it's up to the OSHA officer to determine whether and which representatives may accompany the officer during the walk around inspection. Next slide. So why does this matter? Um, one of the biggest concerns to come out of this new rule is that it grant, it could grant union access to non-union workplaces. So it's possible that employees in a non-union workplace can designate a union representative as their walk around representative. Uh, the commentary released with the new rule specifically addresses this issue and says that union representatives will be permitted permitted to represent non-union employees during the walk around inspection. Next slide. <clears throat> so this rule is set to be effective May 31st, 2024. Um, we do anticipate that a lawsuit will be filed attempting to enjoin the new walk around rule before May 31st. Um, next slide. In the event that the rule is not enjoined before May 31st, uh, employers may wish to consider some options if an OSHA investigator were to show up with a union representative. So one thing that an employer could do is refuse to allow the union representative on site. Uh, the officer may conduct the inspection without the union representative, or they may seek a warrant to conduct the inspection with the union representative present. Employers would then need to challenge such a warrant um, before the courts. Next slide, please. Alternatively, uh, employers can allow the union representative access to the opening conference. Um, this And while well at the opening conference, the employer could require the officer to demonstrate the good cause for having a union representative present. If there is no good cause, the employer could then inform the officer that the company is allowing the officer access that the union representative must leave. Um, at that point, the officer would face the same cho choice as before. They could move forward without the union representative or they can seek a warrant to require that the union representative is present for the walk around. Next slide. Um, and then finally, as an option, if uh, an officer were to show up with a union representative, the employer could inform the officer that the company challenges the good cause, but will allow the inspection to proceed. Um, they can clarify that while the union representative may participate in the walk around, the company will not allow the representative to participate in any supervisory interviews or non-supervisory interviews on site. Um, and then with company management accompanying the officer and representative during the walk around, the company would be able to minimize interaction between the representative and the employees. Next slide. So some key takeaways, uh, monitor whether the new walk around rule is enjoined. This is something that we'll be keeping an eye on and we'll write about in the blog if there is a case that ultimately enjoins this new rule. Um, and then ensure that procedures are in place to inform management how to respond if an officer wishes to inspect the site with a union representative. Um, so definitely some concern that this will allow non-union workplaces or union access to non-union workplaces, but we'll have to wait and see what happens with this rule and whether or not the courts do ultimately enjoin it. Okay, I'll set there. All set. Okay, great. Excellent. Thank you so much for that summary. Um, any questions, let us know. Um, next on our list today is Teresa Resnack out of our Rochester office. As I mentioned earlier, this is a topic that was requested in uh, by some of the attendees. So Teresa is going to walk us through some of the recent um, uh, developments in this area of law. Teresa has really been a person with our firm who's really followed this area of the law and has developed quite an expertise. So happy to have you here today, Teresa, on this subject. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. It's been a little while since I've been on the webinar, so I'm yeah. thrilled to be back. 
And, you know, most of us are here in New York. Um, most of us hopefully are aware of what the New York laws allow and do not allow for discrimination. I'm gonna back up a little bit and just explain how we got here. If you cast your minds back to the very fundamental groundbreaking case in this area, which was in 2020 at the United States Supreme Court, it was a case called Bostock versus Clayton County. It's actually a series of combined cases under Title VII, which is the federal law that protects employees across the country from any kind of discrimination based on sex or gender um, and a bunch of other protected categories as well. In that Bostock decision, the Supreme Court found for the first time that gender identity, including transgender status, is a part of sex, uh, such as it is considered by Title VII, and therefore um, you cannot discriminate against somebody because of their gender identity or transgender status in the same way that you couldn't discriminate against them because of their sex. Uh, so that pulled in countrywide federal protection for transgender folks in employment. Um, before that, it had been generally up to the states whether or not they wanted to protect gender identity and employment. But that Bostock decision, which of course came really at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, and I think for that reason was perhaps not given the attention it might have been, uh, was very fundamental in making this a rule across the country. What I've seen from the cases is that Bostock has been widely applied and frankly upheld <laughs> to the most reasonable extent by the courts across the country. And when you're looking at litigation for transgender protections, it tends to fall into three categories. Uh, the first one being education. That is by far the most broad category. We see uh, students advocating for their rights on campus. Uh, we see students advocating for their rights in public schools and private schools parents advocating on behalf of their students. Um, all of those things are falling under the education umbrella. Uh, we see some freedom of speech issues from professors and teachers, some freedom of religion issues. By far the biggest umbrella where we've seen these transgender discrimination cases has been in the education context. Um, we've also seen it quite a bit in health insurance context, uh, carriers litigating whether or not they need to cover somebody who's getting gender affirmation surgery, um, or somebody who's changed their gender. And then we see it too in the criminal context or in the prisoner's rights context where uh, inmates are wanting to switch prisons or access medical care based on a change in their gender identity. In employment it, itself, you know, under Title VII, which is, you know, what we talked about with the Supreme Court and the Bostock decision, uh, the main issues tend to stem around the following, the first being restroom usage, um, you have to allow somebody who is transgender or has a different identi gender identity than the sex they were assigned at birth to use the group restroom of their choice. Um, failing to allow them to do that can result in significant penalties, uh, which we would call compensatory damages for emotional distress. So even if you haven't fired the person, simply uh, preventing them from using the group restroom consistent with their gender identity can be very costly. There was a 2021 decision out of Illinois that assessed emotional distress damages in the amount of 220,000 um, in favor of an employee who had been denied the right to use the women's restroom, even though they asserted their gender identity as female. Uh, that's one big area that we see litigation being enforced. Um, we also see in the area of pronoun usage, consistent past use or consistent use of somebody's incorrect pronouns is considered a type of harassment that is particularly true in New York. Um, you know, again, it has to be consistent and pervasive. It's not that somebody makes a mistake one time and the company is open to endless liability, but if there's consistent pervasive use of the incorrect pronouns, that can be a type of harassment and discrimination courts are upholding that as well. In looking at these decisions, the main defense for employers is that they've treated everybody consistently under their policies and practices. So as an employer, you want to be able to say if you're ever sued in any context, um, but especially in this context, I think that you've treated everybody who's violated the same policies in the same way, um, that you haven't singled out people of differing gender identities, that you haven't singled out transgender employees, and that you've treated everyone consistently. There have been some cases where employers have been able to succeed 
using that defense. There's another case out of Illinois where somebody claimed that he was discriminated against for being transgender um, when, in fact, he uh, was just placed on indefinite leave due to a medical issue. And the court found that the employer did that for everyone, whether they were transgender or not, if they were experiencing a significant medical issue. So you see that that really had nothing to do with the gender identity. Um, and the employer was able to show that by looking at its past practice and showing that it treated people consistently. And they were able to get the case dismissed on that basis. Uh, so I always encourage you <laughs> in employment uh, decisions to treat people consistently. Um, that'll be a big theme of our upcoming workplace presentations. I'm presenting in Corning and Rochester on harassment discrimination. I can guarantee you we'll be talking about that. And you see it bear out in these cases as well. Um, just a quick reminder for folks, you know, other than pronouns um, and restrooms, you want to make sure that you allow people to use their gender um, identity and their name as asserted in the workplace as broadly as possible. There may be some legal documents that have to use the legal name, such as the I-9, um, but by and large, for internal purposes, you have to allow people to use their current name, whether it's been legally changed or not. Same thing with their pronouns. Um, another place I see employers get tripped up often, and I review a lot of handbooks, is in their dress code policies where they differentiate clothes that are appropriate for women versus appropriate for men. I would urge you, if that is in your dress code policy, to get rid of it. Um, not something that you need to differentiate based on, and you can usually get the same goal in terms of professional appearance or whatever your goal may be without using those gender-specific differentiations. Um, so those are some of the things I see um, as I as I go through my practice and as I look through the decisions across the country. I hope that was helpful to all of you. And certainly, if you have any questions, I'm always happy to talk about these. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's move on here to uh, our final topic of the day um, on ERISA. Um, John, thanks for being here again. You were here pretty recently talking about ERISA. So thanks for being a frequent contributor. Um, take it away. It was. Thanks, Kristen. Yes, for those of us who joined back in, uh, I think, late January, we talked a little bit about the fact that this is the 50th anniversary of ERISA. So we are doing some programming around that anniversary. And we thought one of the things that might be helpful to you folks in the audience is to do do some refreshers, some ERISA 101 uh, type programming, just because sometimes we get caught up in the newest um modifications to the law, the newest developments, and we forget some of the core principles as we operate our employee benefit program. So this program is really, for, for many of you, it may be a refresher, and that's always good sometimes to, to uh, confirm that you're doing things accurately, correctly. Uh, for others, there might be a few things that you weren't aware of as, as we go through this presentation, but we find it helpful to sometimes go back to the basics just to set the baseline on, on certain issues. And today, what we're going to talk about are, are welfare plans subject to ERISA. And, and, and why are we talking about welfare plans? For, for a couple of reasons, really. One is because there's becoming more focus on health and welfare plans by the regulators. Uh, you know, recent legislation under the CAA uh, provides for enhanced kind of fiduciary obligations with respect to welfare benefit plans meaning that there's a little bit more oversight expected with respect to your welfare benefit plans, especially with respect to costs and expenses related to those plans. So there, there's more of a microscope on your health and welfare plans. And then in the context of the, of the subject that we're really talking about today in ERISA and ERISA coverage, uh, many of you may have a single retirement plan. When you look at the two worlds, typically in employee benefits, typically we're talking about retirement plans and then in one world and then the other world, health and welfare benefit plans. And your retirement plans, most employers either have a single plan or maybe two plans, easy to identify. Most know that those are subject to ERISA and have committees that are devoted to making sure that everything is on uh, compliant with regard to those plans and, and that we're taking care of those plans. The health and welfare side usually is not had as much oversight in the past that, that we've seen. And sometimes there's not as much of an understanding of which one of those arrangements that you may offer is subject to ERISA, which then triggers certain requirements, including potentially a Form 5500 requirement, a plan document requirement, some participant reporting and disclosure requirements. So certain legal 
um, requirements go along with being ERISA. So it's good to understand which of our arrangements are subject to ERISA. And, and the fact is, as I said, the retirement plans, you might have one, maybe two plans. You might have a number of other arrangements that could fall into the scope of ERISA on the health and welfare side. And it's not as easy to understand typically from an employer's perspective. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So the big picture questions to consider really are first and foremost, does my organization maintain an employee welfare benefit plan that is subject to ERISA? And again, that will trigger certain obligations if you do. Um, if I do have an ERISA plan, am I complying with ERISA document requirements? And also we'll talk about reporting and disclosure requirements to go along with ERISA as well. And if I'm out of compliance, what should I do? What steps should I take to put myself into compliance at the end of the day? So those are kind of the big picture uh, themes that we're going to be talking about through this presentation. You can go to the next slide, please. So let's start with the definition of a welfare benefit plan, and then we'll talk about some exceptions. And as you can see from here, this is an excerpt from the, from the statute. It's very broad, um, including medical, hospital care benefits, sickness, accident, disability, death or unemployment, vacation benefits, apprenticeship, et cetera. So this is a very broad definition that we start out with, you know, and subsumed among medical, you have dental, you have a health flexible spending account. So there's all kinds of subcategories that might fall within this broad definition of what is subject to ERISA. But then there are a number of carve outs that we'll talk about now that make it a little bit more narrow at the end of the day. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Oh, next one, Kathy, please, thanks. Okay, let's start with the statutory exemptions. First, we, I know there's a number of uh, folks in the audience today who work for municipalities, for governments. There is an exception for governmental plans. So good news for you, you're not subject to ERISA. One thing to remember though, if you are a governmental plan, many of the provisions that apply to employee benefit plans may apply to you through something called the Public Health Service Act. For example, COBRA, many people think of that as an ERISA requirement. That's also underneath the Public Health Service Act. So there are requirements that are pulled in outside of ERISA for governmental plans as well that you need to be aware of. Uh, certain church plans are also exempt from ERISA. Uh, this is the third exception here, main, plans maintained solely for purpose of complying with workman's compensation, unemployment compensation, or disability insurance laws. We'll talk about those in a minute. Those are basically, if the, if the benefit is required by a statute, then it's really governed by that statute, by a state statute rather than ERISA. Plans maintained outside the United States and then certain unfunded excess benefit plans. So those are some of the statutory carve outs from ERISA coverage. Go to the next slide, please. What about regulatory exemptions? There are a number of those as well. We won't talk about all of these, but the first one there, payroll practice, you often might see this if you maintain a short-term disability plan and you don't have an insurance contract and you're basically just continuing your payroll process to pay someone either all or some percentage of their normal pay when they become disabled. So that is one exception from the ERISA coverage for a disability plan, which when we talked about the, the broad definition would normally be covered under ERISA. Uh, another common exemption that we see often, if we look down on that list, certain group or group type insurance programs, these are your supplement, supplemental programs, your AFLACs. Now there are a number of requirements in order to fall under this regulatory exemption. Uh, for example, it can't be endorsed by the employer. So if you put yourself out as sponsoring this plan rather than just be making it available to employees to pay for on a 100% basis by the employee, then that could bring it back into ERISA coverage. So there's some nuances here, but here's a, a general exemption list from a statutory perspective. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. There's also uh, case law exemptions, and, and probably the, the, the biggest one is from a case from a number of years ago, U United States Supreme Court called uh, Fort Halifax, commonly inferred as the Fort Halifax exemption. And from a big picture perspective, what this case looked at is ERISA is meant to govern employee benefit plans, quote unquote. And so when you think about the common de definition of a plan, you need some kind of ongoing administrative scheme to it. Plan infers that there's something going on more than a one-time event. So in Fort Halifax, basically what happened is the U.S. Supreme Court held it a one-time severance payment 
was not governed by ERISA because among other things, and it required the sort of ongoing administrative scheme characters of ERISA. So basically there was a set formula that, that came up with the particular severance payment for employees who were terminated. It wasn't an ongoing arrangement, didn't require payment over a number of years, didn't require other benefits to be provided to those employees. So the Supreme Court looked at it and said, you know, that's not really a plan. So therefore we're not uh, underneath the ERISA rubric. Um, and where we see this most often is with respect to severance arrangements. So, so one-time arrangements were really more or less, you have a single lump sum payment and maybe some limited medical or, or other benefits, as long as they're limited and don't provide for uh, a continued administ administrative scheme. Typically, we would say those are outside of an ERISA coverage. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so, so what are some benefit arrangements that are often overlooked by employers, uh, things that we see dealing with employers over the years to piggyback of what we just talked about in severance pay. Although there is the Ford Health Act exemption, there are a number of severance situations where severance pay uh, arrangements are considered ERISA plans. Um, you know, one thing we see often is uh, an employer saying, well, I, you know, I don't have a written severance plan, um, but you know, whenever I'm doing kind of a larger layoff, and that may happen periodically. We always pay out people or provide some kind of continued medical under under this formula, but but it's never been formalized. Well, you know those ad hoc severance pay practices, even if unwritten, can constitute uh, a severance plan if it doesn't fall within the Fort Halifax exemption, for example. Um, you can also see a plan being uh, created by individual contract with executives. This is probably less common, but you know, many of your executives may have severance provisions in their, in their contracts that, that um, could potentially trigger ERISA plan coverage. Usually they don't, but it depends on the nature of the, that agreement and what benefits are described in that contract. So th those are scenarios where employers may often overlook uh, the requirement to treat an arrangement as an ERISA covered plan. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, what, what are some other common plans that or arrangements that we see employers overlook? Uh, one is EAPs, employee assistance programs. Um, if, if those programs provide more than quote unquote referral only services, you know, for example, counseling, mental health counseling, with, which many of them do, I would say most do, then that's a medical benefit. And, and that's subject to ERISA then, unless an exception applies. So many times we we see folks not treating their EAP as an ERISA covered plan. So, so you know, what harm does that do? Well, you know, we have 5,500 filing obligations potentially for that plan. We have reporting disclosure um, obligations for that plan. So it, it's probably not a huge risk to the employer, but when you're looking at your overall benefit package, we wanna identify those plans that are subject to ERISA and then address those ERISA requirements. Business travel accident programs similar to EAP often overlooked as a ERISA plan um, and certain employee pay all benefits. And this is where we we're talking about the regulatory exceptions a, a few minutes ago. These are the AFLAC and supplemental type insurances that typically are offered to employees as, hey, you can pay for this on a 100% basis. Um, and you know, you'll have this separate, perhaps individual contract maintained with the insurer uh, but if there's sufficient employer involvement, if they're subsidized, for example, uh, by the employer or the employer endorses that particular arrangement as a plan that they are offering as the employer, um, that could be considered to be an ERISA covered plan. So you have to do a little bit of analysis for each of those supplemental plans if you aren't treating them as ERISA and taking the position that are covered by that regulatory exemption. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, Short-term disability plans, we talked about this a little bit before, um, that there is the payroll practice exemption if you're paying for you know, those benefits um, out of general assets, and basically that's you're continuing the regular pay or some percentage of the regular pay. Um, they are, so that, that is an exemption from Marissa, and, and most plans design, and we talked about the, kind of the governmental exemption if, or, or statutory exemption that if it's designed to comply with a state disability law, like New York State disability law, those are exempt from ERISA. ERISA. However, that 
to the extent that your, uh, your plan provides enhanced benefits, goes above and beyond what the statutory requirements are, um, then you could have an ERISA benefit, uh, covered benefit on your hand as, as a disability benefit. So you need to take a deeper dive, perhaps, depending on the nature of your uh, disability benefit program to understand whether that, in fact, is covered by ERISA or not and all the intended requirements for an ERISA covered plan. You go to the next slide, please. Um, so just a little aside, uh, maybe a public service announcement. So cafeteria plans, many people may be aware of these as, as really the, the tax arrangement governed by Section 125 of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, and in this, the initial caveat here is that this is not an ERISA plan, um, typically, unless the, the cafeteria plan also has a ERISA covered plan as, as one of its features. For example, a health flexible spending arrangement is an ERISA covered plan and typically part of a cafeteria plan. But if you only have a premium only type arrangement, meaning you have a cafeteria plan that allows employees to pay for their medical, dental, et cetera, on a pre-tax basis, that's not an ERISA covered plan, but it is required by an internal revenue code and proposed regulations to be in writing. So we'll often see this when we ask questions to some folks, well, what does your cafeteria plan say? Well, I'm not sure if we have a cafeteria plan or maybe we had one of those once and it's in a drawer somewhere or people kind of tend to forget about these. Maybe they've been around or haven't been touched in many, many years. So maybe a good time to maybe dust off that uh, file cabinet and check to see if you do have a cafeteria plan. Even if it's older, there will be some probably updates. If, for example, you know, we've seen oftentimes many times that these haven't been touched in 10, 15, 20 years. Good time to check out if you do have a cafeteria plan document, what that plan document says and, and whether it's been updated or not uh, for you know, subsequent legislation. If we go to the next slide, please. Okay. So when we talk about, we're talking about documents, I talked about, well, if you're subject to ERISA, you have a plan document requirement, you might have a 5500 requirement, there's reporting and disclosure requirements. When we talk about going back to the basics, really when we're talking about plan, plan document, uh, trust if applicable, it's usually less common for welfare benefit plans to have a trust, but they could have a trust. Uh, summary plan description, which is basically if the plan documents really think of the employer owned side of it, um, you keep that in your in your file. Summary plan description is the employee facing document that you have to distribute to participants and beneficiaries. Um, and it's really supposed to be a, a you know, a, a word in a way for the average participant to understand the terms of the plan. Summary material modifications, summary reduc material reduction and covered services. Those are all notices that you need to provide to employees if you change the terms of the plan. And summary benefits and coverage is kind of this super SPD concept that was born out of the Affordable Care Act that's supposed to distill the provisions of your medical plan for to you know, an eight page description. So these are some of the components from a documentation standpoint that we should be thinking about to comply with ERISA's requirements. We go to the next slide, please. So when we talk about a plan, what, what needs to be in it, uh, th these are formal requirements and really the only one that I want to hit on here specifically is naming one or more fiduciaries. I talked about the open of the presentation that there's more and more focus on welfare benefit plans by the regulators uh, looking for plan sponsors to carry out their fiduciary duties with respect to those plans uh, in, on the welfare side, which is something we've all, we've seen for the past 10 or 15 years focus on the retirement side. Now we're seeing a little bit of shift to the welfare plan side. So we're seeing more and more welfare plan committees being created uh, to deal with welfare benefit plans on a more formal basis and kind of an acknowledgement of the fiduciary requirements that go along with health and welfare plans as well. So that's, I think that'll be a trend in the next uh, upcoming years for more and more of a focus on these health and welfare benefit arrangements and the costs and the fees associated with them. Whereas in the past, again, 10, 15 years, we've really seen that really in the in the uh, retirement plan forum more. Go to the next slide, please. So what about, I mean, we, we often see, especially for, for smaller employers, um, you know, when they talk about, well, what, what, where's the description of your benefits? They might have some something in a handbook 
and maybe they have insurance contracts that are provided by you know the applicable carrier is this enough is this sufficient um usually not when you're talking about strict compliance with regard to ERISA and ERISA's document requirements and and moreover those documents typically don't contain the type of protections that you typically want to see in your plan documents for their employer and yourself. I mean, certainly, you know, those insurance contracts are written by the insurance companies and they have their look, they look at that through their lens of what needs to be in those, in those contracts where they don't necessarily have uh, protections in them that particularly relate to, to the employer, to you. Um, you know, discretion to interpret the terms of the plan, reservation rights to, to terminate the plan, things like that that we often want to see in a plan document and a summary plan description. Um, and it might be in, there might be inconsistent terms with what are in those insurance documents and what you actually do. Um, and from a summary plan description standpoint, there are um, you know, there, there are regulatory requirements of language that needs to be included in the document for it to be considered a summary plan description. And those typically are lacking in an insurance document. So, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, when, when you look at it, are, are, they, um, are they useful? Certainly, we need, we need the insurance contracts that describe, uh, you know, the, the coverage being provided. But from an ERISA standpoint, usually you want a, a, another layer to that. In, in your plan documentation. Let's see if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, penalties, there are penalties out there. There, um, you know, these are adjusted for cost of living adjustments, so they're a little bit higher, but just be aware that there are, there is a reason that we do this. At the DOL audits you, you can have a penalty imposed upon you for non-compliance. Um, next slide, please. Um, for non-compliant plans, consider an internal audit, identify the scope of problem. Uh, Kathy, if we could get the next. Uh, if you maintain multiple plans, consider a RAT plan document. Um, a RAT plan covers multiple uh, arrangements in a single document, so you can fi file a single form 5500, simplifies your administration. If we go to the last bullet point. And if you don't if, if, if non-compliance results in a Form 5500 failure, there are programs, the Delinquent Filer Voluntary Compliance Program, uh, to be able to file those 5500s if you haven't for a number of years on, on, a, on a basis where the fees will be far less than the caught on audit. So hopefully this was helpful for the, the audience today. Again, it, it's a refresher understanding when you look at your welfare benefit plans, uh, what may need to be covered by ERISA, and kind of steps you can take to make sure you're compliant. So Kristen, I will kick it back to you. Yep, thanks, John, appreciate it. Um, I know we ran over today and appreciate you staying with, um, with us for a little extra time this week. So um, that's all we got today. If you have any questions, reach out to any of our presenters. Thank you.